I think it's an easy temptation to look at Ozu's last film, Autumn Afternoon, as a kind of final meditation on recurring themes that he's had throughout his career. However, I don't think that's very true since at the time of his death, he was already making his last film, another film, which was Radishes and Characters, of course, didn't get made. And I think all of his contemporaries, Yasujiro Ozu was definitely the most quote-unquote Japanese of his contemporaries, such as Akira Kurosawa, uh, Mizoguchi, Kobayashi. He was definitely the most Japanese. When I say the most Japanese director, I really do mean in almost every aspect. First, in the themes that he would cover. Oftentimes, especially in his later films, especially after World War II, Yasujiro Ozu's movies became more about post-World War II Japan that had to assimilate into the 20th century that had to had become westernized. And because of that, it was always about a generational conflict between the younger generation of Japanese people and the older Jap uh, generation of Japanese people. The generational conflict lies at the center of a lot of Ozu's movies and even at this one. Seeing as how this is a movie about a young Japanese girl, well, not really about the girl but more of her father who has this, this young Japanese girl who looks after him and then she also has to decide as a young woman whether she will marry, get married or stay at home to look after her father and her brother. That's the kind of central conflict of the movie and one of the great things about that is that it's a very simplistic, uh, just very low conflict, or rather not low conflict but low stakes kind of intimate family drama, almost mundane really. That mundane approach to cinema, that mundane reality of everyday Japanese, very slow paced sort of everyday Japanese life is what's so I think charming about a lot of Ozu's movies, especially from the 1950s up until the 60s, from Tokyo Story up until uh, An Autumn Afternoon about kind of this mundane atmosphere. It's not to really uh, criticize the film really, but to note that style of that approach of that Ozu will always kind of have these long kind of contemplative shots. Not too long though. His movies tend to be very contemplative. He's a very contemplative director. He would often have these scenes where you're just allowed to breathe in what um, Roger Ebert would call the pillow shots where you would have these contemplative uh, uh, pillow shots of outside areas or of inside, of interior scenes of just long quiet shots where you're allowed to breathe and when you contemplate the scene that you've just taken in kind of a way, there was a way that uh, Roger Ebert had described where it's sort of like you see a scene and then you look out the window and you contemplate, you think about the scene that you just saw. There's room to do that in, his lot of, in a lot of his movies. Roger Ebert was quoted saying about Ozu, from time to time I return to Ozu feeling a need of, a need to be calm and a need to be restored. In terms of cinematic quality, there's a lot to say about Ozu's approach to framing and camera placement. For instance, Ozu would always, almost always, especially later on in his career, would have his camera placed very sort of unusually low, unusually low to sort of, and how uh, David Bodwalada had expressed it, to establish a common visual design for the movie, you see. Ozu himself had said that he wanted to eliminate the floor and then emphasize the top, the upper area of the shot, while still balancing the top to bottom, left to right. And oftentimes these low positions would add a sense of 
depth of real depth and layered spaces within the shot, which made it, I think, more tasteful. In terms of, there, there was a way of, there was a way in which Ozzy would obsess over the little details in terms of, of creating shot compositions, not just details in the little props he'd use, but the colors he'd use. And as we, as I was mentioning before, with the sense of depth he uses, not just with um, his use of low angled framing, not just also with his use of deep focus, but also his use of color would draw your eye into the frame. He would often use uh, colors like red or orange. He'd have something red or orange in almost in every frame to draw your eyes deeper and deeper into the frame, to the depth of the image. In fact, Ozu had been quoted once saying that there are 10 different shades of, of red, and it was very well known that Ozu's favorite color was red. Ebert had actually said in his review that these short compositions that draw your eyes into the frame, they would often, they give his films a kind of depth of space. Uh, that is worth noting when it comes to cinematography in this movie, particularly in his later movies, is that there is never a point in this movie where the camera would pan, it doesn't tilt, it doesn't zoom in, zoom out. Each shot, every single shot in the movie is a stationary, unmoving shot. The reason being is because Ozu often felt that moving in the camera, zooming in, zooming out, would often ruin the composition of the image ruin the composition of the shot so then he would put so much like very meticulous detail in each shot that was taken and then having to move it even to zoom it in a little bit or zoom it out a little bit would then ruin the composition to the actual point of the film i think the movie has a kind of poetic quality in that poetic quality in its rhythm in the fact that you can sense that this movie is split up into sort of stanzas like in a poem you have a repetition or a rhyming of certain plot points for instance you have the Hirayama can see that in himself and see that in his daughter and can see that relationship so then that's sort of what frightens him and what hits home for him and what he doesn't want for his daughter you could say that a lot of the um, what the film has to say by way of, of gender politics is very antiquated, which you can make that assessment definitely. However, I think it's brilliant in the way that it tells its story in that poetic sense, in that repetition of stanzas. But ultimately, there are these moments in the film which are accentuated by the surrounding subduedness, how most of the film is very calm and polite, but then when you get to these emotional character moments, where you get these emotions uh, that you've been alienated from throughout the entire movie, they really hit hard and really hit home. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why this is such a great film and such a by such a great director.